land of droughts and flooding rains can soon expect more of both, much more. That's what the climate change scientists tell us, and the federal government now agrees. Climate change is a fact, not a theory. It is present tense, not an if, but a now. But over the past 10 years, Australia's consumption of electricity has soared. Most of it comes from power stations that emit two tons of carbon dioxide for every ton of coal they burn. Our electricity greenhouse emissions in Australia have grown 50% since 1990, and ABEAR forecasts that they'll grow by another 50% by 2030. So we've got to go beyond what we're doing right now. Most of the money and attention has gone on new ways of making electricity, clean coal, renewable energy, nuclear power. But they're all expensive. It's much cheaper just to use less, especially in our own homes. Australian households create 20% of the nation's greenhouse gas emissions. By 2030, with a reasonably strong and comprehensive energy efficiency program, household greenhouse gas emissions could be cut by about 30%. Tonight on Four Corners, the fight against global warming on Australia's home front. the ribbon development along Queensland's Gold Coast, Corumban Creek winds through rain-forested hills. Here, an old dairy farm will soon give way to 140 homes. On the eastern side, so that it catches the morning sun, we'll have the round earth panels. We can also but don't think you can plonk an off-the-shelf project home down in the Corumban Echo Village. You and your architect will have to satisfy the body corporate that your house meets its rigorous sustainable building code. It runs to 70 pages. This is the plan. It's not heavily notated at the moment, but hopefully you'll find it compatible with the ideals of the noble project. Uh, We've got a railroad here. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, this is an innovative a uh, roof that helps energy efficiency in a home, it also helps climatic comfort. It's a polystyrene phone sandwich, and it has a uh, skin, uh, metal skin on top and bottom. Very fast, quick to install, uh, and a nice finish. You just whack the whole thing on. Yep, it just gets up, it can go up within a day. Echo Village Managing Director Chris Walton calls this house his living laboratory. Uh, what, are we, what are we standing on? Well, this is our thermal mass for this lightweight building, mm. and it's actually our water storage. So it's concrete tanks, water cell tanks, uh, and we put our finished floor on top of it, and through that concrete slab floor, we uh, put piping and we rig that up to a solar panel that heats the water in wintertime, so we get free um, central heating. Slowly, the Echo Village is taking shape. Some homes are modest, there'll be others whose owners won't see much change from a million dollars. But all must touch the earth lightly. All must be extensively insulated. Rainwater tanks, solar hot water and photovoltaic panels for generating electricity are all mandatory. The village will be entirely self-sufficient in water and will use about a third of the mains electricity that a housing project of this size would normally need. A lot of people would look at these houses around here and think, well, yeah, but they're going to be expensive and they're for greenies. Is it really possible to build sustainable houses at a reasonable price? Absolutely. The people that are buying into the Eco Village project here are mainstream people, mums, dads, families, older people. They're people interested in community and environment. What's happening? Ian and Sasha Kennedy and little Olive are among the first to have actually moved in. They built a pleasant three-bedroom house, but there's no home theatre, no rumpus room, and like every other house in the Echo Village, absolutely no air conditioning. The house is designed so that we don't need it, 
by having doors that you can open in um, all sides of the house and the big door here and the louvers there, you can get a, a cross ventilation, a cross breeze, no matter what direction the wind is blowing. Mm. So it helps to cool the house. Um, there is... Uh, Have you actually, you haven't lived through a summer yet? No, no. no. <laughs> Stood on the block many times in summer and felt the breeze, so we're almost certain it will work. Yeah. No, we're certain it will work. Yeah. Yeah. There's a good breeze that blows up the valley here, so yeah. it will be good. On top of the land price, the house has cost $250,000 to build. Rainwater tanks, solar hot water system and all. Obviously you could buy a project home much bigger than this for that money. That's right, you could, yeah, but it wouldn't have the sort of features that you can design into this house. And some of the things that make this more expensive are things like the photovoltaic panels and the, the solar water heating, but things like that are going to become more and more standard anyway. Perhaps. In Victoria, for example, every new house must be fitted with either a rainwater tank or a solar hot water system. That requirement is in addition to a stricter building code. Three years ago, the Victorian government mandated that all new houses should be built to a five-star standard of thermal efficiency. So they use less energy to keep them warm in winter and cool in summer. For the average new house, it's hardly meant a revolution in building practices. Reaching the five-star standard is mainly a matter of better insulation in walls as well as ceilings. And there are fewer large windows. Is the outside temperature, obviously. This 350 square meter house will cost $220,000, but only a negligible amount of that price, says Henley Holmes's Peter Hayes, is attributable to the five star requirements. It does depend what home you're building. If you're building a traditional home on a concrete slab, brick and tile roof, um, we think the cost is negligible. I mean, these homes cost us about $1,000 more over from two and a half to five star when we designed to make it a five star home. But the vast majority of houses built in Australia are 80, 90%, I'd suggest. Our studies show that the cost of Five Star, the additional cost on a new home, is very minimal, around $1,500, but the returns to households are considerable. It's far cheaper to make a house thermally efficient when it's being built than to fix it later. The Australian Building Codes Board has representatives from state and federal governments and industry. In 2005, it considered following Victoria's lead by raising the minimum standard in the Building Code of Australia from three and a half stars to five. According to Alan Piers, who's a member of its expert steering committee, the board thought it was doing what the government wanted. The Prime Minister in 1997, in his pre-Kyoto announcement, said he would give the building industry 12 months to make progress on voluntary improvement if this voluntary approach does not achieve acceptable progress within 12 months, we will work to implement mandatory standards. That was the genesis of the whole thing. But that was some eight years earlier. Well, governments have not made this a priority area, have they? <laughs> but the Building Codes Board ran into ferocious opposition from some powerful lobby groups, notably the Housing Industry Association which represents 45,000 builders and contractors across Australia, most of them small businesses. The HIA claimed then, and still claims today, that the five-star standard significantly increases the price of the average new home. It certainly did add in excess of $15,000 to the price of a house as it existed back about four or five years ago. Yeah. What was the board's reaction to that claim? Show us the evidence. They couldn't. They had been alleging that for so long and, you know, show us the money, show us the evidence, where is it? Didn't come forward, they couldn't do it. Sydney architect Caroline Pidcock specialises in renovations and new houses that minimise the need for artificial heating and cooling. And then we come to this room, which is a separate sitting room. We've got high level windows to yeah. get sunlight in. She's the architecture representative on the Building Codes Board and voted for the new five-star code in the teeth of the HIA's opposition. The Housing Industry Association, I think, has not provided good leadership for its members in this area because I think that Australia's got to stop thinking about, oh, my God, isn't this hard and isn't this tough? Go and look at what's happening in Germany and Scandinavia. I mean, I've got architects working in my office from those places. They can't believe what we're allowed.